Hey guys, this is Martin Wright from Argos Dog Training. Today we'll be going over the body harnesses. We'll be going over head halters. We'll talk briefly about pronged collars. We'll talk about the martingale collar. We'll talk about the sidekick. I hope you enjoyed this video. Here we go. Um, the first tool that I like to discuss, the body harness. I use a little bit of imagination and a little bit of history research when I'm thinking about these things, these tools. Bear with me as I go through that. I don't think that humans, when we first started coming into contact with canines, would have naturally went to a body harness as a way to keep a dog or a canine near us. It would be much easier just to get a rope and throw it over the dog's neck, you know, rather than coming up with a pretty complicated device. Say you're a butcher and you have um, a Rottweiler or a progenitor to a Rottweiler, big beefy dog, strong dog, you know, protective abilities and all that. What you might do is you might attach a cart to your dog and have them drag the cart to market where you could sell, you know, your, your meat. Um, and when you do it, the, probably the first times, they just put a cord around the dog's neck. They put a rope around the dog's neck and the dog would pull, but they realized that the dog was probably having pretty much great difficulty with that. So they had to come up with something else. And that's where you get into the harnesses, you know, where it relieves the pressure from the dog's neck and it puts it across the large muscles of the back and the shoulders and the chest. So that way the dog can breathe easily as it's doing the work that it's supposed to do. Later on, we've developed these tools. You know, we use them a lot. The body harness is probably the most popular tool that I see when clients first come to me. You know, a lot of the times I see their dogs on a body harness. Um, this harness is the easy walk. It's supposed to be a no pull harness. And what that means is that when it goes on the dog, the strap is in the front at the chest. So if the dog pulls, it turns the dog towards wherever the leash is. Leash attaches here, dog starts pulling, it turns the front part of the body towards that leash, towards the owner, and then it could discourage pulling. Some dogs though will learn to pull anyway, right? Another thing about the body harness is that a lot of the times I notice that dogs don't really love them. They don't love stepping in them. They don't like having them around their body. Um, I know that these tools, the material that they're made out of can chafe, you know, it can rub the dog. It can, I've seen dogs with bare patches under their front legs, you know, because of the harness. Um, we also know that these harnesses, they put pressure on different points on the dog's body. It can lead to problems with spinal cord. Um, especially a poorly fit harness, you know, and a poor behaved dog, those two together can lead to a lot of problems. Um, there's many li little adjustments that can be made on the harness in order to size it. Um, those take time, and, and if the harness is not sized correctly, then a dog can, a lot of times, just slip out of it. You know, even when they're sized correctly, there are some harnesses that a dog still can slip. So you want to be careful if you do choose to use this tool. This is a great tool. I have no problem with this tool. If my dog is on the tie out or something like that, I would use a harness. If my dog is, um, if my dog is pulling me on my skateboard or running alongside me on my bicycle, a lot of the time I'll use a harness for that kind of thing. Right, um, a harness is a good tool if you already have good communication with your dog, if your dog has already been trained. It is not a tool that we have developed as humans with the intention of communication or training with the dog um, for the most part. So those are some things that I want you to keep in mind. This is one harness. These are larger body harnesses. They are kinda, they strap differently across the dog. Body harnesses, great tools. Okay, so another kind of harness is the head halter. That's the head halter, the head harness. Um, so that would be something like this. This is uh, called a gentle leader. And what it basically does is that it um, harnesses the dog's head. This goes over the dog's muzzle, this little loop. This big loop goes behind the dog's ears. I could hook my leash to here. And then once I have that all hooked up, then I can, um, I can guide the dog using the head halter. First thing that I like to say a lot of the times is that we use this tool, we develop this tool with large quadrupeds, horses, cattle, cows, things like that. 
animals that are way stronger than us, you know, that weigh a lot more than what we weigh. Um, when we developed it, what we do is we're able to control the face, the head of the animal. And when we control the head of the animal, then we have some control over where the rest of the body is going to go. The thing that we have to keep in mind about head halters when we're dealing with dogs is that do not really, it doesn't really fit into their system. And what I mean by that is that we as humans did, were not using these tools all the time with dogs. Dogs also don't use things like this with each other. You know, um, they don't communicate in that kind of way. Um, so what can happen when we introduce a dog to a head halter is that they can naturally fight against the tool, try to get it off of their face, try to get it off of their head. Um, with good communication, we're able to communicate to the dog that we would not like them to do that. And in most cases, that will stop. Horses are different. Horses, a lot of the times we breed the horses and we breed horses that we can ride. A lot of the times we can't ride a horse unless they have a head halter on. So the, the horses that reject the tool, those go out into the field, you know, and we don't ride them, we don't breed them. That is the difference. Dogs, we don't breed them according to their ability to tolerate this. So when you're using it with a dog, a lot of times in the beginning, um, there can be some fighting against it. There can be increased stress level and things like that. Cool thing about these tools is that they rest right across the bridge of the nose. And if you've ever seen a person doing this, you know what they're trying to do. They're self-soothing. They're calming themselves down by pressing on their nose um, a little bit. And dogs will do the same kind of thing. As a matter of fact, my dog, if I put my hand a lot of times like this, she'll walk right into my hand. She's trying to do it now. She'll walk right into my hand and she will press her face into my hand. And it's a way that she calms down. Sometimes she will press her face on the side of my leg. And that's a way that she could calm herself down. So the tool, by having that rest across that same spot, can help to calm a dog down. Another kind of um, head halter is a tool that my friend, the sidekick, transitional leash, that my friend Heather Beck developed. I like this one. This is my favorite type of head halter. Um, and the idea here is here's my little doggy. Ruff, ruff, ruff. Here's the halter, it goes right over the top like that, and then we could attach this to the collar. The reason I like this halter, head halter better is because um, the, the, the point where the leash makes contact with the device, where the leash makes contact with the dog, is up behind the dog's ears. And I like that. Um, I find that to be a lot easier um, for the dog to understand. Another thing I like about these tools, all the head halters, is that when dogs start off, they're fighting to get this off. And if we teach them not to fight to get this off, a lot of the times when you're dealing with reactive or aggressive dogs and they see another dog or they see a person that they want to be aggressive towards, the first thing that they will do is they'll try to get this off again because they know that they don't have control. Like if they pull that way, I do, and then I have their whole head. Their whole head will move away. So they got to get that off so that way they could continue to you know, be aggressive continue to be a reactive. Um, but if in the beginning we do a good job of teaching the dog not to fight against the tool, a lot of the times what we'll see is the dog will see a dog that triggers them and they'll try for a second to get it off. They'll realize quickly they can't get it off and then they'll just ignore the dog, you know, um, which is better than being reactive to the dog. At that point, we could start to build a good association, you know, with ignoring the dog. And in time, we could start to, they might glance over and we can mark and reward that. And then pretty soon we have a dog that can be in the vicinity of other dogs without being overly reactive, aggressive, um, as well as towards other people as well. So it is a good tool. I like it a lot. I use it a lot with reactive and aggressive dogs. Um, these, this tool is actually one of my favorites for that. So that is the sidekick. Okay, so next we'll talk about collars. Right, collars are um, an extension of a basic rope. One of the things that I always say to my clients is that if you give me a rope, you give me a dog, and you give me some time, and I'll be able to train that dog just using the rope. You know, of course I need food and stuff for the dog so that way it could continue to survive and all that. 
but um, but the rope itself is a good communication tool. We could take a rope, give me an eight foot rope and I could tie a loop in it. That could be enough efficient as a collar, something to go around the dog's neck that I'm able to hold. I could also tie another loop in it and now I have a handle. Um, if you look at that tool, the sidekick that we discussed earlier, what is it? It's a rope. It's an advanced and fancy rope. It has this little plastic clip on it that slides back and forth. It has some metal bits on it um, that does different things. But basically, this is just a rope, you know? Um, first tool that we probably came up with is something like this, a slip, a slip lead. You know, um, and we still use those. Some people call them choke collars. Um, I call them slip leads because they slip along the side. Nobody wants to choke the dog. The reason I call it a slip lead is because it actually slides, right? So, so they have slip collars and things like that. We haven't discussed them much on our channel yet. Maybe we'll do something about that in the future. But that was probably the most basic adaptation from a strip, regular rope to a tool that people can use with dogs. Um, after that came a ver variety of other things like ropes that you could tie together and make a collar and then tie another rope through, you know, things like that. Um, but jumping ahead many, many years in the future, a tool like this came. And this came probably after the regular buckle collar. This is a martingale collar. And the idea here is that if the dog pulls, the two sides tighten up around and it will cause tension to be pretty much equally spaced around the dog's neck. This is Dee Dee's collar. Dee Dee's everyday collar, I also use it for walks a lot of the time. It can be used as a training tool. Just like how a rope could be used as a training tool, this can be used as a training tool. It takes longer you know, to, to train a dog with a tool like this than it would with a tool that has been more developed for the intentions of training. So that's what that is. From there, um, this transferred itself into things like this. This is a Starmark prong training collar. We're not gonna go into much detail on this because we have a video direct dedicated to that. This is the Herm Springer training collar. You know, but basically it's a martingale collar with um, teeth on it so that way we could communicate with the dog in a way that they can understand. All right, so those are the tools that we use. The most important thing is not the tool itself, but how we use the tool and making sure that we have consistency in the use of the tool. That is the most important thing. Um, the body harnesses are a little bit harder to communicate with, in my experience, to use as a communication device, mainly because the connection points are so different from the regular collar. Um, the connection point for a body harness could be in the center of the chest or a lot of the times in the center of the back of the dog, um, while most of the communication tools that I train with are around the dog's neck. So transferring from um, a, a prong training collar to a martingale collar to a buckle collar, that is easier you know, transition to make because it's attached to the dog's neck and when you pull up, it's the same sensation as any of the other tools that fall in the cal collar category. But with the harness, when I pull up, it's connected here to the center of the chest. So I'm, I'm thinking that the sensation is gonna be much different. Um, not to say that a dog can't learn that when they feel tension here pulling up, that that means to sit as well, or tension on the back pulling up, that that means to sit as well. They can learn that. But, um, but it's not as smooth as transition as it would be to transition from a buckle collar, you know, or from a prong collar to a buckle collar, right? So that is something I want you guys to think about. Um, once the dog is trained, the tool, the thing that we use to hold the dog near us, becomes pretty unimportant. Once the dog is trained, we don't need anything to hold the dog near us, right? We don't need anything at all, because that's the point of the training. Once you build a house, you could take down the scaffolding, you don't have to swing hammers around anymore, right? Um, the house works, because it was built. Same thing with, um, with the training. Once the training is done, you don't need that stuff, you know? So um, I hope that that is helpful to you. Okay, so if you like what you see here today, then definitely um, subscribe to the channel. <laughs> Check the description below, below, for uh, links to our other social media networks. Diddy, you don't like this work.
You don't like this work? Excellent. But this is your job. You have to do it.